This is Diary of a Nation. I'm your host, Christina Zlotnick. My podcast explores the human experience. Vera Rivard was just 16 when she swam the English Channel last summer. Nearly a century prior, her idol, the American Gertrude Ederly, was the first woman to swim the Channel. Rivard beat Ederly's time by 29 minutes. The New Hampshire teen, along with her mother and younger sister, joined me to discuss the trip and their love of swimming. Vera, you've been training for years for the English Channel Swim, and you completed your first one-mile open water swim at the age of 10. You eventually worked up to a 25-mile swim that crossed the Canadian border. How did your love of swimming begin? My parents just wanted us to be water safe because we live on a small lake in Springfield, New Hampshire. And then from there, we joined swim team. It's about half a mile from our little place in the lake to the town beach and I was like maybe I can swim there and then eventually I did that with my mother and then I was like maybe can I can do there and back and then at one point I got a little too fast for it to be safe for me and mom to just swim there and back so we the family got a kayak and then from there it just kept getting more involved and then I did the kingdom swim which was the one mile swim And then from there, I just did a three-mile swim that same year. And then the next year, it just kept adding and adding. I fell in love with this um, sport of open water swimming and just swimming in general. And that's really where it all started. I just, I love the waves and just having fun. How did you make the leap to the English Channel Swim, though? I wanted to do something fun. I had talked to a lot of people and I got to know a lot of different people through Kingdom Swims events. There are a lot of people who have done a lot of amazing things. And with that, I heard about all these things and English Channel was definitely something that I had just set my eye on about. That English Channel swim is considered to be, in many respects, the ultimate long distance challenge. What makes that so? There are different challenges that make it that way. A couple of them are the fact that it is 21 miles long. Um, There are currents and then the tides that you have to match the timing with for those. Because of the tides and currents, you swim in like an S formation almost. Also, the amount of boats that are there uh, can range from around 800 boats a day, um, like big um, shipping boats in a day and the everything else. And the fact that it's colder, around like 60 degrees, I think is the average. Um, And then there's also sea life you have to worry about. And there's a 12-hour cycle for tides that you have to make sure that you um, time it right. One of our podcast listeners wanted to know if you met up with any marine life while you swam. I saw a couple jellyfish and I was fortunate enough to see two porpoises, which I was told later by my boat captain doesn't happen very often. That was, I just felt really lucky for that. What rules did you have to follow to be in compliance with the Channel Swimming Association? So some of like the rules are that you can't leave the water, so you can't touch a boat or touch a person or touch like anything that will help you to float or anything like that. And now you have to be 16 or older in order to swim the channel. Some of it is relying on your training. Like I train a lot. I train five, six times a week or more um, swimming and So it's definitely just getting in and knowing what your body is capable of and when your body is really, really telling you to stop and um, not panicking. Um, I also do a couple like ice swims where through Kingdom Swim, they cut a two lane um, 25 yard pool in the ice. And so I've done that now three times. And so the events range from like 25 yards to a 200, which is really fun to do. And it's like a cutout in the ice. Did you coat your body, the exposed parts with some kind of protective barrier, some gel or grease or something? Not to a large extent. That's another like rule. Like you can't, like you can have something to like sew in parts that you know will rub like underneath your arms and places like that. Um, But you can't like put excessive amounts like all over. Um, normally, like I try to do like lanolin and desiltin, 
mixture of those. Also, it's like the same thing as sunscreen as far as the desitinous. Was there much shipping traffic along your route? Um, There were definitely a lot, of, but I, like when I'm swimming, I don't see a whole lot. And so normally it's just like, I kept, like I swim and then all of a sudden I'm like, oh, hi, but you can see the boat. Like you don't see a whole lot when you're swimming, but like you really have to trust your boat captain and your crew in order for them to keep you safe and to pick the best route for you with the boat traffic that's there. I am a frog-like swimmer, which I imagine isn't the most efficient way to cross the English Channel. What strokes did you swim? Um, I did freestyle, and something that you have to be aware of is that you, before you swim, you have to like um, tell the captain what stroke you're going to be doing. What were the weather conditions like during the swim? Um, for the most part, they were pretty nice as far as that. It got a little wavy in some parts. <laughs> I tend to like it when it gets crazier, like weather-wise, like as far as the waves. So I was pretty happy. The water temperature was around like 63-ish. And then the air temperature was around 58. Are you just mentally strong? You're not panicked at all? I definitely panic, but it's just I have to like rely on my training and know like the work I put in and it's a lot of like by the time I got to actually starting swimming the English channel I was just so happy to be there because I had trained for over two years for that specific swim and yeah a lot of people would describe me probably as stubborn though. So you finished the solo swim just before midnight in 14 hours and 10 minutes and that distance shore to shore point to point is 21 but it took you 33 miles to get across and I looked at the map of your actual route which is a bell curve like you said earlier, it was the change in the tide that caused that route, correct? Um, yeah, the official swim distance is 21 miles. I'm still not sure exactly the distance that I swam. I just know that the like the swim when you put it like down on paper is officially 21 miles. Um, the current like kind of like takes you almost in an S formation because there is a 12 hour cycle of when the um, tide goes in and out. Um, a lot of that though is like relying on your boat captain who is like your expert into like the planning and going out and when it's safe to do so. I was very fortunate that my boat captain was very experienced with this and that he's been doing it for quite some years. So that was, I was very happy for that and lucky. I read that you went to the pub after you finished and that sounds like something that I would do. What did you do in the pub? The pub itself was actually closed. I don't drink. I don't intend to. A lot of the finishers of the English swimming the English Channel will go there to sign their name um, on a little space in the wall. Um, it's kind of like this weird tradition that English Channel finishers will do. I'm not 100 percent sure on the history of it. I just know that it was something that I always really wanted to do, and I was very happy that we that I finally finished that I was able to write my name on the wall. And I read that you really weren't concerned that much with your time as you were the fact that you accomplished this great feat. I really just wasn't concerned with my time. I was more, by the time I actually got to the channel, I was didn't even know if I was going to swim. Like we knew that we were leaving for England a month before because of COVID and every all the travel restrictions. And then I have a window, which was the last week in August. And then... Um, before that, I watched my entire window go by. And then the day I was working with my boat captain trying to find the best time I could go. We ended up going one day after my window because my captain was, I went the first of September and my boat captain was very nice and um, let me go after that, which I don't know, he was willing to work with us. So that was great. So nowadays you have to be at least 16 to swim, but the youngest, I believe was an 11 year old boy before they instituted that rule. It's just incredible that you're a 16-year-old mm -hmm. teenager and you did this. It, it's hard for me to wrap my mind around, A, because you're young, mm -hmm. B, because you have all the confidence in the world, it seems, and all the training, and C, swimming is hard. It's the most difficult sport that I do when I did a triathlon. It's something that I love to do, and that's really where all of this started. I love to swim, so. 
One of your future goals is to finish the open water triple crown, which is the English Channel swim, check mark, 20 bridges around Manhattan Island of New York, check mark. But I don't believe you've done the Catalina Island swim near California, correct? Correct. Um, I have not done the Catalina Channel swim. Last year, due to everything, they canceled their season, and I'm hoping that they're going to run a season this coming summer, but they're still not sure. So that is definitely something that I want to do. I'm not sure when. I don't have anything planned at this point for that. I just can't because they're not even sure if they're going to have a season. And yeah. A man living here in New Hampshire reached out to me when I was doing research for this interview, and he said his great aunt was the American competitive swimmer, Gertrude Ederly, who is who was the first woman to swim across the English Channel. And she was 19 at the time, just three years older than you. She finished the Channel swim 29 minutes after you, nearly a century ago. And she eventually went on to medal at the 1924 Summer Olympics in Paris. You even dressed as her for a school project once. Is qualifying for the Olympics one of your goals? Like, I would definitely love to talk to whoever um, had, like, this reached out to you in that sense. Um, Gertrude Edley is my, like, idol. I know that sounds kind of weird, but I grew up being like, I wanted to do like what she did. I found the same kind of joy that I I would imagine she did in open water swimming. Like luckily when I went to New York City in the area for that 20 bridges, I was able to um, visit her um, in, this, in the grave site. So that was really um, just a really cool moment for me um, to be able to visit her in that sense. I definitely have dressed up for her in a couple school projects. Um, she's kind of like my idol, and it's fun. And I, as far as the Olympics, I definitely that's a like goal, but I'm not 100 percent sure if I'm like fast enough to be in the Olympics. Either way, I just love to swim, and I, I don't know. Have you heard from other great swimmers, Diana Nyad, for example? Any other idols you have? Um, I. I haven't heard from Diana and I yet, but um, I've heard from other extraordinary swimmers, Lynn Cox, Sarah Thomas, Liz Fry, who has done also some amazing things. Um, there are just so many, like, it feels like one huge, big community, like everyone's connected and like, it's really fun. And I feel really, really lucky just to be part of that amazing community. Well, I will reach out to that man. I don't know him personally, but he sent me a Facebook mm -hmm. reply, the one who is a relative yeah. of G Gertrude Ederly, and I'll give him your mother's name and phone number if that's okay. And yeah. maybe you guys can yeah. talk on the phone or something. Vera, my last question. You had a swim coach who passed away. You swam the English Channel in a pink cap in her honor. Could you explain how she impacted your life? Her name is Dorsey Reynolds. Um, she was just a great positive role model. Unfortunately, she did lose her battle. But like, I believe that her like spirit lives on in everyone that she coached. And I feel as though she's a part of me. She definitely like helped me through all a lot of things and figuring out that I love to swim was definitely something and she was a positive role model and just a great person. So Darcy, I'm a mom just like you, and you just must have burst with pride when you saw her finish. What was running through your mind? I was definitely proud, but in that moment, it was more, I was kind of worried for her safety at that point. Like, like I, I don't think it was until later when we actually got onto land that I could even like process, you know, like, wow, look, look what just happened. The day before, I think I, you know, I was so proud that she was able to get there and to like have the fortitude to like get like, you know, it was, it took two years of fundraising and two years of work to even get to the water. And then we actually left New Hampshire, like on August 8th and she didn't swim until the first of, of September. So it was quite a long road to even get to have the opportunity to swim. It was a victory no matter what. I mean, you never know when you get in the water, what's going to happen. Like there's so much out of your control. 
And so I was so proud of her, but also like, I was really happy, like, let's get her in the boat. Let's make sure she's warm, you know, like just make sure everything is good because your relationship kind of changes like for us anyway, as her crew, like I kind of step out. I try not to be mom and like, we have a different relationship than like being mother, you know, like it's much more like, okay, these are the, this is what we expect from each other. I'm still mom ultimately, but it has to be much more like give and take when I'm her crew member. Then once we got, you know, made sure everything was safe and everything, I was just unbelievably proud of her. I was, would have been proud if she didn't make it. I mean, it really, it's just a feat to get there that she had that dream and she followed it. And so that was for me, the most important part. The trip cost around $15,000. Is that typical? And what are you paying for with that money? Yeah, I think um, COVID made it more expensive because we did, you know, we did have to go from, yeah, the beginning of August and we didn't come home till I think September 4th. And so we had to rent a flat for a month. Um, and then we had, to, you know, we had to rent a car and to get around like, and then you have to have food delivered, you know, like the groceries delivered because we were in quarantine for two weeks, um, once we got there. And so, you know, we had to make sure that was all set. So it was a much bigger thing than originally that we had planned it two years before, you know, you have to book two years before. And so it was a much larger thing than we were planning. My husband originally was going to go, but because, you know, he has to work, he couldn't take what was, uh, six weeks off. And so it ended up just being Margaret and I's crew. You know, we had the plane tickets and the, just a lot of things that come up that, you know, in a month, you know, traveling for a month rather than like we th originally we thought we were going to be there like 10 days. So you and your younger daughter were on that boat along with some officials. Explain what all of you were doing during the 14 hours of the swim. So there's two pilots. We were lucky enough to have a very experienced pilot. His name is Peter Reed, and he works with his son, Peter Reed Jr. And that, so they were the, the pilots. And then um, Peter Reed's junior son, Aaron, was the official observer. And so those are the three besides Margaret and myself who were on the boat. And so there, so the observer is just basically to watch to make sure all the rules are, are followed correctly. And then of course, if like there was something that went wrong, then he would, you know, like help with that. The pilots um, choose the direction and, you know, like they're doing everything with the boat. And so um, Margaret and I are, we, like somebody has to have eyes on her at all times because there's lots of things that can happen in the water. You know, it's cold, um, there's sea life there. You're always watching. So, and then somebody, usually the other person who doesn't like, if you're communicating back, like, okay, I'm watching right now, you go make a feed and, or get the feed ready to go. So like every 35 minutes, between 35 and 40 minutes, you would give her nourishment, like on a, you throw out a water bottle with, um, on a long string and she would sw swim because she's not allowed to touch a boat or anything. And so she would, you know, we're getting things ready. We're seeing, we're, but mostly we're watching, we're, we're watching out for animals. We're watching out for like anything like debris. It could be anything. Cause you know, it could be trash. It could be a large log. You're just watching, trying to do whatever you can to keep her as safe as you can. And you're watching her stroke rate. Um, you know, you want to watch for signs of hypothermia. There's just a lot of things that you just have to keep out, keep an eye out for. Did you have a distress signal worked out? What would have been the plan if she needed to get on the boat and couldn't finish? The whole swim, you're communicating with your swimmer through hand signals because you don't want them picking up, you want them picking up their head as little as possible. And so, you know, we're getting we're giving signals back and forth, like, Hey, how are you feeling? How are you feeling? Like her stroke rate is a good uh, indicator of how she's doing. Like if, if she starts to swim slower, then that's something that you would be concerned about, you know, for her arms be you know, like the rate that her arms are moving in the water and things like that. I would have her pick it up or whatever. Luckily we didn't run into any of that, but yes, there's definitely, there's this company, like all these companies are very used to people having to get out. There's a boat that you could launch, like the captain could dive in. We would get her into the boat. Like they're radioing back and forth with 
like every, you know, there's lots of communication going on. So there's definitely a plan in place. So if something did happen, you know, they're ready to, to handle that. Your family got a lot of media attention in the weeks following her channel swim. Who did you hear from? Was it worldwide? Yeah, we were just so lucky that um, the Associated Press picked up the story. I mean, open water swimmers aren't used to, you know, getting that sort of attention. A lot of times they get up, uh, get onto the beach and there's, you know, a a few people clapping, but, you know, they do it because they love it, not for this kind of thing. So, yeah, I mean, she was, (laughs) she got so much attention. We're so lucky, so thankful. And we're hoping that it was something positive for the sport because there's, there's, the community is so giving and they're so willing to help other people. And it's so much fun. Like you're out in nature and you see things that you would never see on land. And it's just a wonderful sport. You live in a town where they threw you a parade, too, when you got back, right? That was so much more than we expected. I I mean, when you live in a small town, like, like everyone knows each other. And we were so, it was such an amazing day. Like, there was something that Vera didn't know about until, like, right before it was going to happen. And we're on the plane. And, you know, like, as soon as we get off, I'm getting messages like, hey, you know, like, make sure you're here at this time tomorrow. Like, she went out to the driveway and like people like we were so thankful like all these people came out and like drove by with flags and they had and they had made signs and it was so exciting people really like cared is there anything else you want to add that I didn't bring up I think that it's important for to dream big like for me as a mother like I'm just this was not expected for us um my husband and I weren't expected to raise ass you know like athletic children um I was kind of surprised so I would just encourage like parents not to like pick their kids interests <laughs> you know like try, try to go with what what their kids like to do we would have never had these experiences if we would have just said no right away because it's kind of a crazy thing right hey mom I'm gonna swim the English channel and I'm like uh-huh you know <laughs> once the passion is there you know kind of if you can encourage them to kind of find a way to kind of encourage little by little and maybe make it possible it's just a wonderful memory that your entire family will have for the rest of your lives. I grew up in New Hampshire, you know, and I would have never even thought when I was growing up that this kind of thing could could happen. So we were so thankful. Hi, Margaret. So you're a competitive swimmer, too. When did you start swimming and how dedicated are you to the sport? As you just said, I really love swimming. I started when I was very young with mommy and me classes and then I started on the swim team when I was around three years old. I saw my sister doing the open water on our lake and it wanted me to do it and try it so I ended up starting trying it with her. It kind of just snowballed from there. When I was I believe eight I did my first one mile race with Phil White at Kingdom Swim. That's the place you have both trained in Vermont, correct? Yes, but at that time, we were only training on our small lake here in New Hampshire called Lake Kalolomuk. We love training together. We still train together at the, till this day, and it's just great to have a sibling to do that with. What are some of your accomplishments? I know you referenced the one-mile swim. Yeah, I did the one-mile swim when I was around eight, I believe, and I did a three-mile swim, I believe, also when I was eight. I did a five-mile swim on Lake Willoughby when I was around 10. I did a border buster swim at Lake Mount for Magog with Kingdom Swim. That was 15 miles twice, but the first time I did it when I was, I think, 10. And then my biggest swim that I've ever swam was in Lake... Massawippi, and it was 18 miles, um, a double crossing. It was nine miles one way and nine miles another way. And a future goal of mine would be uh, next year to have, hopefully, I was supposed to do it this year, but because of the Canadian border being closed, I couldn't do it. I am planning to do that 25-mile swim that my sister did a couple years ago. In search, And it's called In Search of Memphry. I'm really excited to do that and hopefully one day do the Triple Crown as well. Wow. So the same path that your sister is on is where you hope swimming will take you. 
yes, because it seems like a very great, like, future. And, like, I love swimming just as much as my sister does. And it's a great experience to see each other do it. And we, like, do things together. We like to do things together. We just like being with each other because we're, <laughs> we're siblings. We We live together. And it's just great to have a sibling that you can, like, be friends with and at the same time be siblings. I hear you there. I have two teenage daughters, so I get that. <laughs> What's wonderful, it's so hard to be a teenager, yet swimming must give you so much confidence and physical strength. Yeah, it definitely makes me feel good. It's like a kind of like a stress relief, you could say, or like during if you go to swim practice on a day, it feels like great to make the world go away for a little bit and just swim. And swimming is like one of the most fun parts of my day. It's like a happy place to me. During the pandemic, I've been doing a lot of cycling when it was warmer and now I'm skiing a lot. And it's just so good for the body and the mind to be out there and be active. Yeah. What were you doing and what were you thinking during your sister's swim across the channel and as she completed the swim? I was mainly looking after her and like giving her feeds and getting her feeds ready and also just kind of trying to stand up on the boat and stay on the boat and not like fall into the water because it was so wavy. But when she finished, I was so proud of her and I was so happy for her because it was my sister's dream to to finish the English Channel and just do it and be there, to be her training partner and to see her accomplish a goal that she really wanted to was really great for me as a sibling because I love her so much. It's, I felt so happy for her and I was so proud. <laughs> There's a video of us and it's just blackness. We're trying to find her because they were putting lights on her as she finished. Once people were yelling, the people getting her was yelling, oh, she finished. We're like, yay. And I, we all yell so loud. And in videos, you can hear us yelling so loudly. And we're so, you can tell we're so proud of her. Learn more about the Channel Swim and see Vera's results by visiting channelswimmingassociation.com. Do you have a good story? Or do you know someone I should interview? Reach me through social media or send an email to diaryofanation at gmail.com. You'll never miss a new episode if you tap follow on your favorite podcast platform. If you like what you hear, write a review and rate my podcast. <laughs>